Ionel de Rochim was the princess of the Rochim Empire. The emperor adored her, even though she was last in line for the throne. His only regret was that she wasn't born a boy. If she had been a boy, she would definitely have gotten the throne so coveted by all. However, Ionel had absolutely no interest in power. The girl was not against her older brother, Agris de Rochim, getting the throne. Ionel loved her family and was happy with them. When Agris became of age, he killed his father with his own hands. Unfortunately, Ionel saw it coming. She saw her much-loved brother, Agris, plunge a dagger into his father's heart with his own hand. Agris, why did you do that? Ionel asked. The girl had never seen her brother in such a state. She couldn't fully believe what she was seeing. Had her brother really killed their father? Ionel, what are you doing here? You don't have to answer, though. That's even better. Father won't be lonely if you go with him. Agris drew his sword from its sheath. In one motion, Agris slit his sister's throat. Ionel woke up in an unknown place together. There was only emptiness around her, and quiet and peaceful music was playing. The girl realized that she had died. A wall of dense glass appeared in front of the girl. Ionel touched the glass, and it immediately cracked. Small shards sprinkled. Finally awake, said a blonde-haired man. Standing next to him was a woman with bright red hair. Ionel had never seen these people before. The girl looked around. The area was completely unknown to her. Ionel looked at her body. Suddenly she realized that she had the paws of an animal instead of her hands. She had turned into an animal. I see you don't recognize us. What if I do? Said the blonde-haired man and turned into a large white fox. Why are you scaring the poor child? Quickly become human, ordered the woman with brightly colored hair. A moment later, the white fox became human. Oh my God, what's going on here? Who are these people? Why did this man become an animal? Have I, the princess of the Rochim Empire, become a divine beast? The girl was horrified. Look, what happened? Why such a commotion? Asked his subordinate, Lord Abelode. Ah, Commander, the Emperor passed away suddenly last night. It's said that Princess Ionel killed him. Narrated the subordinate. Lord Abelard knew Princess Ionel well. He had even served her for a while. Lord Abelode, have you given any thought to what you want to do in the future? I know you are an extraordinary person, and I am sure you will definitely become a hero whose fame will spread all over the world. Ionel said one day as she watched drops of warm rain fall from the sky. Lord Abelode couldn't believe that such a sweet girl like Princess Ionel could do such a thing. Lucia, did you hide again? Let's go home your mom is already waiting for you, said Lenore, taking Ionel's hands. Ionel had been in the white fox's body for over a month now. As the girl had suspected, she had been reborn into a divine beast. Lenore was her new father. In the beginning, the girl tried to deny the truth, but soon she accepted her fate. Once long ago, the girl had read in books that divine beasts began to appear on earth from the shards of the gods. They could take the form of silver foxes, golden lions, blue whales, red wolves, white eagles, and green snakes. Divine beasts who inherited the power of a god could communicate with nature and spirits. They took care of heaven and earth, seas and rivers. But one day, disaster came, and the beasts had to work together to defend the continent. No one had heard of them since. Now Ionel knew that the divine beasts had not gone anywhere. They had simply hidden in a distant forest and never showed themselves to anyone's eyes. After the catastrophe, the divine beasts had lost their connection with the spirits, but still retained their divine powers. Divine beasts could transform into humans from birth. They also had a talent for swordsmanship and magic. Unfortunately, Ionel couldn't turn into a human. She couldn't even speak. This was most likely because Ionel remembered her previous life, and it kept her in a state of confusion. She still didn't understand why Agris had killed her and her father. The throne would not have passed to her by law anyway. Agris would have become emperor. Ionel really wanted to ask her brother why he had done it, but how could she do that? 
After all, she doesn't know how to talk. Little one, why are you so upset today? Did you resent me because I prevented you from conquering the North? Did I hurt your sense of dignity? Lenore asked. The girl only sighed heavily. There was nothing she could say. Lenore approached the cave and called his consort by name loudly. Syria came out of the cave and took their daughter from her husband. Ionel liked her new parents. They were kind, gentle, and very fond of each other. Lenore printed out the letter that came to his name. Quite an unpleasant situation. Imagine, they say that the emperor has changed. I can't believe that the past one was killed. They say the murderer is his daughter, Ionel de Rochim. Then she killed herself, said Lenore after reading the letter. I get it. Agris decided to blame it on me. But why would he do that? He would have ascended to the throne unhindered anyway, thought Ionel. The girl wept bitterly. Not only had her father died, but she had been made to blame. Lenore and Syria hurried to comfort their daughter. They began to speak tender words to her and immediately brought her a tray of her favorite fruits. Could it be that she's in pain? She even refuses to eat. She hasn't been able to calm down for hours now. At this rate, she'll soon collapse without strength, said Syria. Syria took her daughter in her arms and started humming a lullaby song. The next day, Ionel's mood improved. The girl promised herself that as soon as she had the opportunity, she would be sure to tell the world what had happened. Then justice would finally be served. Syria, I need to retreat to the human world for a while, said Lenore to his consort. The human world? This is my chance to bring justice, Ionel rejoiced. If I don't take action, Vermont may attack the forest. And besides, it would be a good idea to pay a visit to the imperial family. It's not for nothing that the silver fox is considered the patron saint of these lands. We should see what's going on in the capital. Lenore changed into his ceremonial costume. Two members of the imperial family have been killed. I can imagine the commotion going on there right now, Syria muttered. Ionel ran up to her father and gripped his leg tightly. She had to get him to take her daughter with him. There might not be another chance to enter the human world. Gee, do you really want to come with me? Asked Lenore to his daughter. The girl looked up at him with big glowing eyes and squealed happily. No, you're not going anywhere. The human world is very dangerous. You're not ready yet. I can't let you go. Let daddy go alone and you and I will get well prepared and go later. Syria promised her daughter. Ionel looked at her father with eyes full of tears. But she will be safe. I see no reason not to let her go with me, said Lenore, much to Ionel's delight. Don't you worry so much, Syria. Your trust in me is directly proportional to her safety. That means that if you trust me, there is nothing to worry about. Besides, you can see for yourself how eager she is to go. Lucia really wants to get into the human world. I see no reason to deny her that. Lenore wrapped his daughter in a warm cloak and traveled with her to the human world. Lucia, before you go to the human world, there are some things you must learn. There are three immutable laws. First, you cannot interfere with the course of history. Second, no one can know who you are. And finally, it is forbidden to fall in love with humans. If they find out that you've broken any of the rules, you'll be immediately taken to the elders and locked away in the divine forest forever. Although to me, all these taboos are just silly. Let's at least pretend to follow the rules so we don't get in trouble, okay? So here we are. This is our home in the human world. When Lenore entered the manor, the knights immediately ran up to him and got down on one knee in front of him. They began to praise him as the Grand Duke of Eloran. Ionel remembered that Grand Duke Lanner Carl Eloran was famous for studiously avoiding all sorts of banquets and receptions. He was so unsociable that he sometimes defied orders from the emperor himself, refusing to appear at the palace. Very few people could boast of being close to Duke Elharan, but no one looked down on him. The duke was the master of the impregnable mountains and the ice wall in the north. His skill with the sword was legendary. But they were not such legends, because the duke really saved the empire from the invasion of barbarians from the north. The rumors about Duke Elharan were truly contradictory. Some said he was a bloody murderer who reveled in violence. 
Some imagined him an ugly old man, others a beautiful young man. The Duke was an enigma, a mystery shrouded in darkness. Welcome home, your lordship, said Aidan the butler. So, is it time to get back to work? Aidan swung open the doors of the Duke's study. The desk was just piled with papers. And you're not exactly welcoming, Lenore grumbled. Come in. You've been away from the manor for a long time, so there's a lot of urgent business piling up. The butler pushed the duke into his study and closed the doors tightly behind him. Let's see what happened while I was away. So the barbarians found a way to overcome the northern wall. But be that as it may, they're nothing but pathetic bugs to me, muttered the duke looking over the papers. So, little one, shall we go camping with you? We need to exterminate these barbarians so they don't get in our way, asked Lenore, and with a cheerful smile, picked his daughter up in his arms. In the evening, Lanner left his daughter in her room and went about his business. Suddenly, the girl saw in the middle of the room a large, shining circle of blue color. From the center of this circle came a young boy with long, white hair. From the pendant hanging from the guy's neck, Ionel guessed that the archmage was in front of her. The archmage was also surprised that there was an animal in the room. He walked up to Ionel with slow steps. And what is this ball of wool doing here? The archmage grabbed Ionel by the tail and lifted her up. What did he call me? Let him look at himself. What a handsome man he's turned out to be. The girl thought resentfully. What's to be done with you? You're too small. You're no use to me muttered the archmage, examining the fox cub. What did you say, asshole? You barge in on me yourself and then immediately start insulting me. I mean, you and I haven't even met. And I'm actually just a kid. I should be treated with the respect I deserve. Ionel began to thrash from side to side. She felt like she was about to burn with shame. As soon as you broke away, the enemies immediately seized the moment and attacked. Twenty people were wounded, and many houses were destroyed. It's not clear why yet, but for the last month the barbarians have been much more active. Narrated Aiden. This happened just as Lucia was born. Her full name is Luan Stella, said Lenore to his butler. Aiden was the only one who was aware of his master being a divine beast. Tell me everything you know about the Rochim family. What's going on with them right now? This is the third letter that has come to your name, so I don't think it's worth delaying any longer in answering. Aiden held out three envelopes to the duke. Vermont decided to treat the fox cub to some fruit. He took the beast with him to the magic tower. Suddenly, there was a loud knock on the door. Master Vermont, you have visitors from Rochim. They're shouting that they won't leave until they meet the tower keeper in person. The caretaker of the tower is that asshole? I never would have guessed. It flashed through Ionel's mind. And what do these people want? Vermont asked. They say they want to uncover the truth about the Emperor's death, shouted the man standing outside the door. All right, I'll take them in. And you, little one, wait for me here. Vermont stroked the fox cub's head. Ionel ran to follow the archmage, but not in time. He left the study, locking the door tightly behind him. Of course, it's not as bad as it could have been. I hope there are still people who believe in my innocence. As long as at least one person believes in me, there's a chance of uncovering the truth, thought Ionel. As the archmage entered the room, the seated men rose from their seat and bowed low to him. You may not introduce yourself. Your clan and title is of no consequence here. Did you not know that the Tower of Mages is sovereign, meaning it is not subject to any state? Don't even think that title gives you an advantage, Vermont warned. We came here to reveal to you the truth about the death of the past emperor, said Viscount Melvier. And in my opinion, everything is already known. Needless to say, after this incident, the reputation of the imperial family has sunk to an all-time low. In my opinion, everything is clear. The crazy princess killed her father in a fit and then killed herself, said Vermont. A princess would never do that. We firmly believe that she was framed, and that is why we sincerely request that one of your mages be given to assist us. That way we can prove her innocence. The men shouted. No, I will not give you anyone. 
Do you really think you should just ask and I'll immediately give you a mage? Offer something of equal value or get the hell out of here, said the archmage, rising from his seat. I put the honor and name of Peron Abelot on the line, shouted Lord Vengor. How dare you throw away the name of the commander of the Holy Order of Knights? I'm not going to help those who can't take responsibility, Vermont exclaimed. Wait, don't go away. Lord Abelodi himself said that you would agree if you knew that he was willing to put his family's name on the line, shouted Viscount Melvier. Well, since that's the case, I'll give you the most experienced magician, promised Vermont. Back in his study, Vermont took the fox cub and hurried back to the duke's room with her. When Ionel opened her eyes again, she saw the sword not far from her face. Ah, Vermont, you should have warned me you wanted to babysit your little sister, said Lenore and laughed loudly. Does a brother have to ask permission to spend time with his sister? Vermont asked. A brother? What are they even talking about right now? But if you look closely, Vermont looks like Lenore and Soraya. He has something of both parents in him. Ionel thought as she looked at Vermont. If you were even a second late, I would have gone to your magic tower and left no stone unturned there, said Lenore to his son. Little one, tell me, did he hurt you? whispered Lenore, asked his daughter. I didn't do anything to her, I just fed her, murmured Vermont. Wait, am I understanding correctly that hairball was the reason you left the palace and weren't even going to come back? A ball of wool? What on earth are you talking about? If your mother heard you, she would be very upset, noted Lenore. Lenore suggested that they all eat dinner together at the same table. Lucia, go talk to your brother, said Lenore to his daughter. And you, Vermont, don't sit there with a sour face, but rather socialize with your sister. You probably don't even know each other's full names. Your sister's name is Lou and Stella, just Lucia to family and friends. Ionel walked over to her newfound brother and touched his face with her paw. And my name is Vermont. It's a pleasure to meet you. At first, Vermont seemed mean and cold to Ionel, but after talking to him closer, she realized that he was kind and caring, though he could be arrogant at times. Ah, I forgot to ask. Have you ever heard of Perrin Abelard? Vermont asked his father. Ionel knew Perrin well. He had no title, no wealth, and no one to follow him. When he entered the Order of Knights, he had only a single sword. However, after only three months, everyone in the palace knew of him. Perrin had the honor of guarding the princess herself. He got his position by winning the knights' tournament. On that day, he was personally congratulated by the emperor himself. Perrin was incredibly talented. Someone like him should be an army commander. Perrin was a great bodyguard for the princess. Ionel wanted to get closer to Perrin, but he did not make contact. The girl tried to be kind to her bodyguard, but she was never able to melt the ice between them. One day, Perrin announced to the princess that he was leaving for the front. He could not participate in the war and protect Ionel at the same time. The girl decided she would not stand in his way, so she let him go without hesitation. Perrin won a series of resounding victories in the South and led the country to victory. He received the well-deserved title of the best knight in the empire and became the commander-in-chief of the Holy Order, blessed by the archbishop himself. Why are you talking about him all of a sudden? Asked Lenore to his son. Someone came to me here on his behalf, claiming the princess was innocent, replied Vermont. Came on Perrin's behalf? Ionel thought in surprise. She hadn't expected that the person who would believe in her innocence would be her former bodyguard. They couldn't even be called friends. By the way, while I was in the forest, I heard a rumor that Perrin has gone mad, said the duke. After your story, those rumors don't seem so groundless. No one in their right mind would throw their name around. Isn't it a little early to take her along? She's only recently hatched, after all, Vermont asked his father. No, it's not too early. It's been over a month since she was born. She's pretty smart, so I think she'll be able to defend herself, replied Lenore. By the way, Vermont, I'm going to the capital. The prince has granted me an audience. I will go with you. I promise to provide one of the strongest mages. But is there any mage in this country stronger than me? Vermont asked, with his chin proudly raised. After lunch, Ionel decided to explore her father's castle. 
When she got to the kitchen, Ionel met the chef Stan and the cook Elsa. They treated her with kindness and fed her delicious sweets. The servants regarded the fox cub as the duke's pet. Suddenly, Ionel heard a pleasant melody. It seemed to the girl that she had heard it somewhere before. Ouch, it's hot, shouted one of the cooks and knocked over a pot of hot soup. The music got even louder, and the sound engulfed Ionel, creating a protective dome over her. Strange, the soup flew in my direction, but there isn't a drop on my fur. What on earth happened? Have the abilities awakened in me? But why can't I still turn into a human? What is the power that protects me? Ionel thought to herself. The next day, Lenore and his son Vermont decided to go to the Imperial Palace. Ionel clung tightly to her father's cloak. Why is she clinging to you? Does she really want to come with us? Vermont asked his father. We'll have to take her with us. We're not going to leave her here, said Lenore. Do you want her to get fleas in the capital? Grumbled Vermont. Well, go ahead and turn her into a human. I know you can do it, said the Duke with a chuckle. Sighing heavily, Vermont began to conjure. An unknown force of mine lifted Ionel high up. Thin, long blue threads girdled her body. The girl lost consciousness. When Ionel opened her eyes, she immediately realized she was in the guise of a child. Vermont had warned that when the spell dissipated, she would return to her normal form again. No, well, why am I in the body of a baby? How will I be able to explain to those around me that I didn't kill the emperor? Ionel thought with despair. It was unusual for the girl to be in the imperial palace again. It had only been a little over a month, and she had already stopped seeing the palace as her home. Everything seemed foreign to her. You're wearing it in the open, not even hiding it. Do you really want to present her as your daughter? Vermont asked her father. Why wouldn't I? Our little girl is special. She needs to be introduced to the world, replied Lenore. Divine beasts were extremely independent by nature. They left their parents early and occupied their own territory. It was not unusual for them to venture into human lands. Vermont noticed that his sister Lucia was not like that at all. He left his parental home when he was only a year old. A month has passed, and Lucia is still a little fox. If this continues, she will need security in the form of her father, Duke Eleron. Stay with your little sister while I confer with the prince. Lenore handed his daughter into Vermont's arms. Ionel began to scream loudly. She had put a lot of effort into being taken into the imperial palace. Ionel didn't expect to be left on the doorstep of the prince's office. What kind of injustice was this? If you keep acting like this, I'll turn you into a mound of dust, whispered Vermont. Don't feel bad. Daddy will be back soon, said Lenore and disappeared behind the door of the prince's study. Well, how come I was left out? I almost met the prince, and I had already set my heart on communicating with him. Why did everything get derailed at the very last moment? The girl thought. Vermont decided to take a stroll through the Imperial Garden. Look at the beautiful flowers growing here. In our north, roses are very rare, but here they grow at every turn. Have you ever seen one? Come, let's go and see what else there is to see, said Vermont to his sister. Don't feel bad, sis. We'll do it your way now. Vermont saw that his sister was upset, so he wanted to cheer her up. He used an invisibility spell and went to the palace. Upon entering the palace, Vermont saw some young woman beating up a servant. Ionel knew this woman. It was Princess Bianca. And how do you tell me to drink this tea? It's not just a hot drink. It's actual boiling water. Why are you wasting my precious time? Is this what Ionel taught you? Bianca asked the maid. Ionel knew the unfortunate maid Marion well, for she often served her. Since Ionel could not teach you manners, I shall have to take charge of your upbringing. Bianca ordered her maid to punish Marion. Ionel's mother died of malaria a month after her birth. Although the emperor loved his daughter, he could not be by her side all the time. Ionel was extremely lonely. When Marion came into the house, Ionel's life changed dramatically. Marion replaced not only her friends, but her mother as well. She filled a void in Ionel's life. Ionel screamed loudly. She couldn't bear to see her favorite maid being beaten. In the same instant, Vermont's spell shattered. 
Ionel transformed back into a fox cub. A familiar melody was heard. Light began to fill the room. It was an unusual soft pink color. What's that? Bianca whispered in surprise. Perrin saw an unusual light coming from the Imperial Palace. He had never seen anything like that before. Is there really lightning outside the window? Why isn't it raining then? Prince Agris muttered thoughtfully. All right, let's not get distracted by trivia, so I'm really counting on you to accept my offer. What do you think, Duke Eleron? Somehow, I feel like storm clouds are going to cover this country soon. The Duke thought to himself. It began to rain heavily. Bianca and her maid hurried away from the terrace. They left Marion lying on the ground. She can't be left here. She'll get sick, Ionel thought. She ran to Marion and began to shake her. The maid was unconscious. Ionel grasped the maid's apron with her teeth and began to drag her into the house. Suddenly, the apron ripped. Ionel fell on her side. She suddenly realized that she didn't have the strength to drag the maid to a dry place. Ionel got up to beat the maid's face with her paw, but the maid still wouldn't come to her senses. Suddenly, someone covered the maid with their cloak. Turning around, Ionel saw Perrin. Vermont had taken his sister to his side with the help of magic. He asked her not to worry as there was someone to take care of the maid. Vermont began to wipe his sister's fur with his cloak. What are you doing here? Are you here on business? Vermont asked Perrin. The man replied that he had come here on the prince's orders. Then go to him. What are you doing here? By the way, your men came to my tower and told me a most interesting story. They declared that the princess was innocent and even swore on your name. It was I who sent those men, replied Perrin in a calm, emotionless voice. You're a divine beast! How dare you throw your name around like that? Are you out of your mind? Vermont was indignant. Wait, what is he talking about now? Is Perrin really a divine beast? And why is my brother so worried about his name? Does a name have some special meaning to a divine beast? Ionel thought in surprise. And why are you so worried about the princess? Did she really come back from the other world and bribe you? Vermont continued to ask. Ionel noticed that Perrin kept his eyes on her. Did he really recognize her? That's my sister. Vermont noticed Perrin looking at his sister as well. It has come to my attention that you don't appear in the Divine Forest at all. That is why you do not know about the newborns. I will fulfill your request as promised, and you deal with all your problems. They already say you're crazy. Vermont created a magical portal and stepped through it. Vermont used the spell again to restore his sister to her human form. Duke Ellerin, in turn, used his connections to cure Maid Marian. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, your lordship. My name is Marion, and I serve in the Imperial Palace. At one time, I was Princess Ionel's nanny. I'm sorry to disturb you in this state, but I have a question for you. Everyone believes that the Emperor was killed by Princess Ionel. What do you think about that? asked Lenore to the maid. Everything they say about her is a vile lie. The princess is not like that. I'm her nanny. I know her. I've watched over her since she was a baby. She would never, ever hurt anyone, and she certainly wouldn't run away from responsibility, replied the maid. Princess Ionel had a good disposition and a big heart. She was special. I have never met anyone like her. Ionel was pleased to hear the praise from her nanny. It was extremely hard for the girl to hold back her tears. She really wanted to run up to Marion and hug her tightly. It seems that the princess was very good to her maidservant. And if she really is that kind, then something is definitely not pure here, said Lenore over dinner. And I would like to point out that meeting the prince was rather strange. We had quite a long talk with him yesterday. And he told me that as a future emperor, he has his shortcomings, but he plans to make up for them with our strength and power. The prince wants us to bow before him and submit to him. In my eyes, he's just a handsome man with a vile soul. I even felt like if I refused him, he would eat me alive. So I just smiled and walked away without answering. The Ellerans have remained neutral for generations. The prince knows this, of course, and tried to sway me to his side after all. He must be up to something. It seems the calm before the storm is about to end. Time to call for Syria.
Lucia, do you miss your mom? asked Lenore. The girl hummed happily. I'll also have to bring Hyken here, muttered Lenore thoughtfully. What's that mad dog here for? Vermont asked. Know that I am against it. If we wish Lucia a bright future, we can't let this ignoramus anywhere near her. You know how important environment is in raising a child. What if he has a bad influence on her? I wonder who Hikan is that my brother is reacting to him like that, Ionel thought to herself. Don't get upset and ignore the fact that your brother won't listen to his father. You don't need to take an example from him, said Lenore to his daughter. Vermont decided to use magic to find Hikan. The magic beam pointed towards the slums. Hikan was found very soon. On one of the streets, he was fighting with mercenaries. Don't look over there. That mad dog got into some kind of trouble again. Vermont locked eyes with his sister. On the ground, Vermont noticed someone's seal. On it was a familiar symbol. I wonder, and how did that seal end up here? Mumbled Vermont. Using magic, Vermont lifted the seal from the ground. Great, they didn't even notice anything. This seal definitely belongs to someone in the nobility, but I can't remember where I've seen this emblem before. After dealing with the mercenaries, Hikan went somewhere deeper into the slums. Vermont decided to follow him. He stopped near an abandoned house, but it's understandable. It's usually in places like this that they do something illegal, mumbled Vermont. Following me? Your gaze is making my neck itch the whole way, shouted Hikan, suddenly turning around. Did you really decide to pass my day and fight me? Vermont jumped off the roof, kicking Hikon in the face with his foot. With a loud groan, Hikon flew into the abandoned house. So do you still want to fight me? Asked Vermont, pinning Hikon to the floor. What are you doing here? And who is that child in your arms? Have you already managed to get married and have a daughter? Hikon asked. Wait, you don't have to answer that. It's finally gotten to me. It's not your daughter. It's our sister. That child will be with me now. You shouldn't be so greedy. You need to share with your brothers. My other brother is the captain of a world-renowned, invincible mercenary army. He, too, is the child of Lenore and Syria. This man is also very successful. How do they do it? Ionel thought in surprise. She looks a lot like a vixen. However, her fur is a rather strange silver-pink color, mumbled Haikan. A man in a long white robe appeared on the doorstep. Greetings, your eminence, said Haikan, and handed the sister to Vermont. The bishop himself came here? Surprised Ionel. In her previous life, Ionel had rarely seen the bishop, as he only appeared at the most important celebrations. The girl had no idea that he was somehow connected to the mercenaries. I told you to come alone, and you bring a child and a babysitter with you, grumbled the bishop. Ah, yes, I meant to warn you, but I didn't have time. I had to bring this newcomer with me. He had no one to leave his daughter with, so he took her with him. I can vouch for him. He won't tell anyone anything, said Hikan. That seal has the same emblem as the brooch on the bishop's cassock, Vermont remarked to himself. All right, I'll take your word for it. Tell me, what's the deal with the slave traders? Asked the bishop. Problem solved. They're dead. By the way, I brought what you asked for. Hikan pulled a folded piece of paper from behind his sinus or handed it to the bishop. After reading the note, the bishop immediately crumpled it up. Here's your reward. The bishop tossed a small bag of coins to Hikan. Please forgive me for this. The bishop put on his hood and headed towards the exit. Bishop, let me ask you a few questions. Answer me how the slave traders got a pass to the great temple. And why would you, a bishop, turn to mercenaries? Vermont asked. For a mercenary, you are far too nosy. Do your job and don't ask unnecessary questions, replied the bishop. I apologize if I offended you with my questions. I was asking out of idle curiosity. It just seemed to me that you had something to do with the slave trade. You don't care about the children. You just wanted to cover your tracks, said Vermont. With a motion of his hand, the bishop called his guards over to him. Mercenaries should just do their job and not ask too many questions. If you want to live long, keep your mouth shut. You are unlucky. You will die today because of your curiosity, said the bishop. The bishop's knights rushed into the room and surrounded the brothers on all sides. Hey, what are you guys up to? We were just kidding around, 
You guys are knights. Do you really support the bishop? He's doing evil by your hands, isn't he? shouted Hikan. If God knew what the temple had become, he'd bring heaven's punishment upon you, remarked Vermont. I follow the will of the Lord. He appeared to me once. I saw him in person, shouted the bishop. Interesting. Something I find it hard to believe is the will of God, mouthed Vermont with a smirk. Hikan grabbed one of the bishop's knights by the throat, intending to impale him with his sword. Vermont closed his sister's eyes again. A few minutes later, all of the bishop's knights were defeated. The bishop wanted to flee, but Vermont pierced his shoulder with his magic beam. You're the bishop, so why did you do it? Remind me what happens when there's no room for a god in the temple. It seems like you once mentioned that the god will send great punishment, said Hikan in an ominous voice. Ah, it's like being reborn. I haven't had this much fun in a long time, exclaimed Hikan. I should probably remind you that you just killed a bishop and the knights of the holy order, murmured Vermont. And it's all my fault again? If it weren't for your curiosity, I would have just taken the money and left. Now you deal with the problems of the case. You're a real bore. Hikan resented. I've asked you how many times not to call me that. It's not like I'm calling you a rabid dog, even though I think you are, shouted Vermont. Hikan didn't say anything back to his brother. He simply vanished into the darkness. Ionel wistfully noted to herself that when she had been a princess, she had judged people only by their appearance and had no idea what they were really like. If she hadn't been reborn, she would never have known what her relatives and the bishop were really like. There was one thing that disturbed me. It seemed to me that the bishop was possessed by a divine beast. He almost revealed himself. If the mad dog hadn't killed him, I might have been able to extract the whole truth from him. Vermont muttered thoughtfully. I see you had a good time with your brother, said Lenore and laughed merrily. I still don't understand why you need Hykon. You know very well yourself that he can be uncontrollable, grumbled Vermont. Well, I'll have to reveal to you all my plans. First, I want to throw a lavish banquet. It's time to introduce the future Duchess to everyone. We need Hykon for security. Secondly, and I'm pretty sure there's a war coming, we need Hykon as a warrior in it, replied Lenore. Neither the prince nor the bishop would reveal their plans for nothing, I firmly believe someone else is behind them, and I think that person is targeting the silver-faced man's domain. I'm not going to let this go. We have a serious battle ahead of us. A few days later, Duke Elharon sent out invitations throughout the empire for a banquet. It will be held at his residence. The banquet was in honor of the young duchess, Duke Elharon's own daughter. Everyone was preparing for the upcoming banquet. Ionel had to try on a lot of dresses. The girl noted to herself that she had never been dressed up like this even when she was a princess. Bring another dress, Aiden ordered. Ionel fell on her back and began to scream loudly. She was tired of trying on dresses. Okay, since you're tired, we'll take a short break, said Aiden. After a while, he rolled a cart with tea and sweets into the girl's room. Ionel was embarrassed that she was eating and the butler was just standing next to her. She held out a brownie to Aiden. Aiden cautiously sat down next to the girl and took the brownie from her hands. Not only are you a divine beast, but you are also divinely cute, said Aiden. Ionel already knew that the butler knew the Duke's secret. Lenore had once told his daughter that Aiden was at the intersection of two worlds. At the moment, Ionel didn't understand what that meant. Mr. Aiden, there has been a disaster. I ordered a dress for the Duchess, but someone has taken it an excited maid shouted. Don't worry, Lucia. I swear on my name I will return the dress to your mother, promised the butler. He came back empty-handed, locked himself in his room, and refuses to come out, told the maid to the duke. What are we supposed to do now? We can't get a new dress made before the banquet. Thank you for warning me. You may go, I'll take it from here, said Lenore and rose from his seat. Aiden was neither human nor a divine beast. He was a combination of the two worlds. People feared him and often called him a monster. The story of the dress stirred up old memories in him. Hearing a knock, Aiden cautiously opened the door of the room. 
On the threshold, he saw the Duke. I've already been told what happened. I know someone stole Syria's dress right out of the atelier. You went to sort it out and then hid in your room. What happened to you? Asked the Duke to his butler. On my way to the atelier, I met an acquaintance of mine, replied Aiden. Come, just hurry up. We don't have much time. I'm going to return my wife's dress and butler's honor now, said Lenore and strode towards the exit. Syria's dress had been ordered from Gavrian's atelier. Ionel knew that this place sold the finest dresses on the entire continent. The outfits designed by Gavrian were popular in the empire and beyond. He was the one who determined the direction of fashion. However, Gavrian did not care about fame or money. He created only when inspiration came to him. In the empire, nobility was measured not only by power or wealth, but also by the number of outfits from Gavrian. I have come to purchase a dress for my consort, Lenore announced as he entered the atelier. You ordered a yellow dress with a deep neckline from us, but it was taken away by Princess Bianca's maid. I didn't even have time to tell her it was meant for your ladyship, said the red-haired boy. The dress needs to be altered. It didn't fit the princess's size, exclaimed the princess maid who entered the atelier. And here is my consort's dress, said Lenore and rose from his seat. He walked over to the maid and took the box from her hands. Tell Princess Bianca that this is the dress I ordered for my wife, said Lenore to the maid. Forgive me, but her highness liked it very much. Would you agree to give it to the princess? May I hope for your generosity? The maid was confident that the duke would not dare to object to a member of the imperial family. You see, this dress fits the princess just fine. I will tell her highness that it was you who gave her the dress. Did she try it on? The duke asked the maid. She nodded. Then we'll have to order a new one. The duke took the yellow dress out of the box and tore it into small pieces. I will not allow my wife to walk around in rags. With a firm tone, the duke said, It was always quiet and peaceful in the divine beast forest. A month after Lucia's birth, Lenore's only problem was finding the runaway baby girl. In the human world, things are different. The imperial family never stopped scheming. They also had to hold off barbarian raids. In addition, Lanner had a lot of small problems that annoyed him a lot. To solve problems, the Duke always approached them unconventionally. Lanner was not the type of person who would follow other people's orders. What have you done? The maid grimaced. If the prince finds out, I assure you, you will regret it. The maid sprinted out of the atelier. Running past Gavrian, the girl accidentally grazed his shoulder. What on earth is going on here? Mumbled Gavrian. So, you are the famous Gavrian. Please accept my apologies for causing a commotion. You see, I ordered a dress, and it turns out it had already been worn. And I can't let my wife wear a dress that's already been worn, said the Duke. But now there is one big problem. My wife has nothing to wear to the banquet. I know time is short, but could you make another dress? I will pay whatever you wish. The Duke pulled a checkbook from a hidden pocket. Leaving a check for a tidy sum, the Duke headed for the exit of the atelier. And why does that monster keep coming here? The red-haired guy muttered. What did he say? Is he talking about Aiden? The staff doesn't seem to be trained in manners at all. We have nothing more to do here. Let's go. The Duke said in an angry tone. A moment later, the red-haired guy fell to the ground. There was a large lump on his head. Ignore the noise, let's go, said the Duke, getting into the carriage. This is the first time I've heard a melody and then something strange happens. But this time I heard something that sounded like laughter. I'm sure it's not all a mere coincidence, thought Ionel over breakfast. But I can't test my theory at the moment. I'll have to wait and see. I really hope nothing terrible happens any time soon. Around lunchtime, Gavrian arrived at the palace. Without you, my heart is torn to pieces with loneliness. Thank you so much for inviting me. I apologize for the incident with the dress. I agree with you. There is no excuse for it. It's a shame I had to find a replacement, but I have designed a new dress not only for the Duchess, as agreed, but also for the young lady. If you don't mind, I'd like to discuss some sketches with you. 
While the sketches were being discussed, Ionel remembered Aiden. As they drove home, Aiden had acted as if nothing had happened, his face expressing no emotion. Ionel suddenly realized that she knew absolutely nothing about his past. The girl understood perfectly well that Aiden was hurt by the red-haired boy's words. But why was he called a monster? Did he really do something terrible? But the Duke knows how to judge people. He trusts his butler. The day has finally come when your mother has finished preparing for the ceremony. She will arrive at our place soon. Divine beasts always hold a ceremony when someone is born. It is an important moment in every beast's life, said Lenore to his daughter. You could say that the ceremony is a birth certificate. That is why your mother stayed in the forest. She had to make everything look good. From the portal Lenore had created, Saria emerged. My mother hasn't seen me in human form yet. I wonder if she will recognize me, Ionel thought. Lucia, my dear, come to mommy. Saria held out her arms to her daughter. Taking her daughter in her arms, Saria held her tightly against her. Since the day was eventful, Ionel fell asleep quickly. While I was preparing for the ceremony, the elders came to see us. They say that Top Scylla has returned, told Saria to her husband. You mean to say that something sly viper has returned? Surprised Lenore. Honestly, then I didn't understand much, but I'm pretty sure he won't budge without a reason, replied Syria. Maybe he found out that Lucia turned back into a fox, Lenore muttered thoughtfully. When did that happen? Syria asked in an excited voice. Vermont told me that for some reason his magic dissipated. When Lucia turned back into a fox, it immediately rained narrated Lenore. You yourself realize that our daughter is not like us. She is special. Lucia was born into a family of a silver fox and a red she-wolf. Usually in such a case, the children belong to only one of the species. It's different here, Saria reminded. Each of the divine beasts had its own unique characteristic that was not common to any other species. Lucia's unique coloring indicated that she had absorbed the abilities of two species. If she really is unique, then anything can happen. You yourself are well aware that her life could end rather sadly, said Syria. When Ionel woke up, she noticed that she had turned into a little fox. So, ready for tonight's banquet? asked Lenore. Enough lying in bed. Time to get ready for the banquet, said Vermont, who entered. He used magic to restore his sister back to her human form again. There were a lot of guests at the banquet. All the aristocrats of the empire had gathered. Does he really think he can cap off years of reclusiveness with ostentatious luxury? Did you hear that the other day the Duke made a scene in Gavrian's atelier? He tore his dress in front of everyone. The invited ladies whispered. The Duke and Duchess entered the banquet hall. What is the meaning of this? I was always told the Duke was a terrible old man. My God, he's the perfect man. Compared to him, the Duchess is some kind of simpleton. She's lucky to have such a husband. The invited ladies whispered again. What are they saying? We can hear everything perfectly well, Ionel thought in surprise. Darling, please don't be nervous. I can see you're annoyed right now, Syria whispered to her husband. I'll deal with those who dared to insult me myself later. After a while, those present in the hall whispered again. Vermont, the caretaker of the tower, came in. He was followed by the captain of the mercenaries, Hycon. Many knew him by his nickname, Mad Dog. A rumor went around the hall that the Duke and Duchess had specially hired these men to guard their daughter. Mr. Vermont and Mr. Hyken have agreed to honor us with their presence at Luan Stella's birthday celebration. The Duke said in a loud voice, I take it you did not expect to see these people here. I wish to warn you that other, equally distinguished guests will be arriving shortly. The heralds loudly announced the arrival of Crown Prince Argus and Princess Bianca. Your Highness, we were already worried you wouldn't come. I'm glad you honored us with your presence. The Duke walked up to the Prince and shook his hand firmly. Duchess, we finally get to meet you in person. And who is that little one in your arms? That must be the culprit of the celebration? Pleased to meet you, said Argus. Looking at the prince, Ionel involuntarily remembered his look when he brought his sword over her. 
And why isn't there a shadow of shame on his face? But I need to keep myself in check. I can't let those around me guess that I know this man well. Ionel thought to herself and turned away from the prince. I would like to be your daughter's godfather, if you will allow it, of course, said Agris. Those present in the banquet hall gave a loud gasp. After all, it was a great honor to be the goddaughter of the crown prince. Every noble family desired it. However, those present were well aware that the duke and the prince were not that close. With his proposal, the prince most likely wanted to try to establish a relationship with the duke. Ionel really didn't want her murderer to become her godfather. She hoped that the duke would not agree to the prince's proposal. Your Highness, my husband and I are honored by your proposal, but unfortunately we have already chosen a godfather for our daughter. Therefore, we are forced to refuse you, said Saria. Really, what a pity, smilingly replied the prince. Greetings to you, Duchess. It seems we haven't had a chance to greet each other yet. I am Bianca Sarient Rochim. Would you mind if we had a little chat? Why, it's an honor to meet you, Saria replied. I noticed you don't have a middle name, said Bianca. A middle name told what clan a person belonged to. Bianca was the only daughter of a marquis, the bride of the crown prince, the future empress. She valued her name very much. You're right, I don't have a middle name, Syria replied. Bianca's words didn't hurt her at all. While passing by Syria, Bianca's friend kind of accidentally poured wine on her. The wine got right on Ionel's face. The wine immediately began to burn the girl's eyes. Ionel screamed loudly. Hikon broke the champagne bottle and put the sharp edges to the girl's throat that knocked over the wine. You want to die? shouted Hikon. Why are you being so rude? My friend Azarel just stumbled. Don't you dare insult her. Duchess El Haran, I expect an apology for your subordinate's behavior, demanded the princess. Syria glanced at her daughter. The latter was rubbing her watery eyes wordlessly. Syria lowered Hikan's hand. You wanted to ruin my dress, but you got on my daughter instead. You will never wait for Hikan to apologize. I believe he will be right, said Syria. Syria gave Hikan her daughter and herself went to the terrace with the duke. She decided to discuss with him what to do next with the imperial family. Hikan decided to take his sister to her bedroom. Suddenly, Ionel felt a fever in her chest. What's wrong? Why are you suddenly so hot? asked Hikan. Suddenly, a bright beam of light burst out of Ionel's chest. While walking around the garden, Prince Argus noticed that some of the windows of the ducal estate suddenly lit up with a bright white light. Damn, Lucia, what to do with you now? Hikan was surprised that his sister had turned into a fox. He thought his brother Vermont's magic was more stable. Now we just have to hope that no one saw your transformation. Otherwise, we'll have a problem. We need to find Vermont right away. Hikan left his sister in the conservatory and went to find Vermont himself. Okay, I need to calm down. Nothing scary is going on. My brothers will protect me. It's a shame, of course, that the banquet is now in full swing and I'm hiding in the winter garden. Ionel thought to herself. The light came from around here mumbled Agris as he entered the conservatory. What's he doing here? wondered Ionel. And what's a silver fox doing here? Agris exclaimed, noticing Ionel among the flower pots. Suddenly, Ionel heard familiar music and someone's voice urging the girl to run. Agris reached out to catch a small silver fox. Ionel rushed towards the exit in the same second. Trouble. Terrible trouble. He's here now. The voice continued to whisper. Ionel stopped and began to listen to the sounds. Behind her, she heard footsteps. Turning around, the girl saw Perrin. What am I supposed to do now? Ask him for help? But I know for a fact that Perrin doesn't like to solve other people's problems, Ionel thought. Yes, he protected me in my past life, but he also didn't help anyone else. Ionel heard footsteps again. She hurriedly hid behind Perrin's long cloak. No, the cloak will definitely not help me. I need to climb somewhere higher. The girl thought to herself and began climbing up Perrin's leg. Sir Abelard, are you doing something? Asked the prince. Perrin bowed low to the prince. Sir Abelard, did a small silver beast happen to run through here? Inquired the prince. 
I really hope Perrin doesn't give me away, Ionel thought fearfully. No, I have not seen any beast, replied Perrin. That's too bad. I must have been dreaming. For some reason, I thought the beast ran this way. By the way, I heard that you came to the princess's palace a couple days ago, said the prince. Yes, that's right, replied Perron. And if I remember correctly, you were the ones who were my sister's bodyguards. You have no idea how hard it is for me to remember her. She was always kind and sweet until she lost her mind. In a sad voice, the prince muttered, I sometimes feel like it's all my fault. I should have paid more attention to her, taken better care of her. Things might have turned out differently then. I was a bad brother after all. What do you think of that, Sir Abelodi? I have nothing to say to you, replied Perrin. Only your sister knows the answer to that question, and only she can tell you how it really was. Perrin had no memory of how he came into the world. He had no parents, growing up on his own. Perrin was a divine beast, but he didn't know which genus he belonged to. Some of the divine beasts had even suggested killing the boy. Others were already protecting him with all their might. Because of Perron, a division between the divine beasts appeared. To keep themselves safe, the divine beasts shackled the boy and placed him in a dungeon. After learning to turn into a human, Perron traveled to the human world. One day, while walking through the market square, Perron heard about a recruitment of knights. Since Perrin had no home or family, he decided to join the ranks of the emperor. He really wanted to see what he could accomplish in this world. Perrin was lucky. In just a few months, he became the bodyguard of the princess. When they first met, the girl was only 16 years old. At first glance, Ionel was the most ordinary princess. However, Perrin felt that she was different from the others. The girl was surprisingly attentive and kind, she showed care to the servants and knights. Everyone around her loved Ionel. Her sincerity could not leave anyone indifferent. She infected everyone with her ringing laughter. To Perrin, the girl was also kind. Sometimes the princess annoyed Perrin with her naivety, but it was still pleasant for him to be near her. These feelings made him feel uncomfortable. Over time, Perrin began to notice that his feelings for the girl were getting stronger every day. It was scaring him. It seemed to Perrin that if he distanced himself from the princess, his feelings would eventually fade away. That's why he decided to go to war. It seemed to Perrin that if he defended the Empire's territories, he would simply have no time to think about the princess. He was surrounded by nothing but death. There was pain and suffering everywhere. Perrin constantly felt the taste of metal in his mouth. Amidst the dust, the fire that engulfed the battlefield, when Perrin swung his sword, when someone's life was on the line, he involuntarily thought of the princess. Perrin began to feel like he was slowly going insane. Even away from Ionel, he couldn't forget about her. No matter how hard he tried to deny the truth, he eventually had to accept it. Ionel had often told Perrin that she saw him as the future hero of the country, so he decided to achieve success in the war and only then return to the palace. Perrin won victory after victory. The high priest, impressed by the boy's dedication, appointed him captain of the knights. In time, Perrin became a hero, famous throughout the continent. Perrin wanted to return to the palace as soon as possible and see the smile of the princess again. Unfortunately, Perrin could not tell the princess what he had accomplished in the war. When he returned, Ionel was dead. When the prince left, Perrin pulled out a fox from behind his cloak. What are you doing here, vixen? Didn't the duke warn you not to be seen by humans? Perrin asked. And don't think you'll always be so lucky. I will return you to your parents. A stomping of feet was heard. Haikon ran up to Piran and snatched his sister out of his arms. Explain yourself, Vermont ordered. Piran had to tell his brothers how he met the fox. So that's what happened. To be honest, I don't understand how it happened at all. I'm the caretaker of the tower. How could I let this happen? Twice already. Vermont muttered thoughtfully. That's because you're not a good mage and you have a bad temper, said Hikan. So she still can't turn into a human? asked Perron. Yes, she stays in the form of a fox all the time, so I have to constantly maintain the transformation spell. 
For some unknown reason, she turns back again and again. If it happens in public, there will be trouble, replied Vermont. Perrin promised to help, which surprised the brothers. After the banquet, there was a real stir in the empire. Newspapers wrote that Duke Elharan and his wife for the first time in a long time appeared in public, and moreover showed their beautiful daughter. The Duke's family, which silently defended the northern borders of the country, organized a truly lavish reception. It was not without a quarrel with the imperial family. Now it's up to the upper class to take sides. Everything worked out just as I wanted it to. Now tell me what Syria and I missed, asked Lenore of his son. Vermont told him that the prince had seen Lucia in animal form. Luckily, Perrin was passing by and helped her. He also promised to teach Lucia how to turn into a human. Oh, I don't like all this. Oh, and Perrin, he's always meddling in everything. I think it's time to send word to Mohiant, said Lenore. After the banquet, Hikan decided to teach his sister how to walk. I see my little girl is learning to walk. What a clever girl. By the way, Hikan, get ready, we're leaving, said the duke who looked into the room. Where are we going? asked Hikan. The duke answered him that they urgently need to see Perrin. Have you decided not to hide your daughter? inquired Hikan to his father. He had noticed that the duke had started taking his daughter with him everywhere. Why, let everyone see. I don't see the point in hiding her, replied Lenore. I think Agris is convinced that the duke wants to take the throne. Now the relationship between them has been spoiled completely. Now the duke is openly traveling to meet with the commander of the knights. Where will this lead to? Ionel thought. Does the duke really want political attention for himself? But why would he want that? And will Perrin agree to help him? I doubt the latter very much. I'm sorry, but Sir Abelard is absent at the moment. He hasn't said when he'll be back. Stammering and embarrassed, the butler said, What's going on here? asked the dark-haired boy. He slowly walked down the stairs toward the guests. Perrin has a child? Why didn't I know that? Ionel thought in surprise. Greetings, your lordship. My name is Ian. I am Sir Abelard's cousin. If this is Perrin's cousin, then why do they look so much alike? Is this boy a divine beast as well? Ionel wondered. I didn't know that Peron had such an adorable brother. Can we wait for him here? Asked the duke. Ian led them into the parlor. I know why you came here. Forgive me, but at Sir Abelodi's request, I will only speak to the young lady, said Duke Ian. I can tell at once that you are related. Your temper is equally nasty. Please, young teacher, take care of my little girl. The duke sat his daughter down in a chair. Ionel did not want to be left alone with a boy unknown to her. The duke assured his daughter that everything would be fine. She could take it easy. Fight on, sister, shouted Hikan and walked out of the room with her father. Can you turn into a fox right now? asked Ian. Ionel shook her head negatively from side to side. Then you can't become a man or beast yourself concluded Ian. This boy not only looks like Perrin, but he talks just like him, noted Ionel to herself. I apologize, said Ian and touched the girl's forehead with his finger. Yes, you really are a special species whose existence would lead to disaster, mumbled Ian. Long ago, divine beasts joined forces to prevent the impending catastrophe. All divine beasts are born from the soul fragments of a creator god, Sometimes it happens that a piece larger than the rest breaks off. This large shard turns into a special kind of divine beasts. Such beasts stand closest to the god. However, it is hard to control such a huge force. Eventually it bursts out, leading to a disaster. Ionel really didn't want to become a catastrophe, because the divine beasts she loved might suffer in this case. Ian took the girl in his arms and carried her into the garden. He wanted to show her something. Young lady, look over there! Ian pointed his finger deep into the garden. Ionel saw translucent pink butterflies. They began to whisper that they wanted to catch Lucia. They're spirits, Ian explained. I think she can see us, but it's okay, the spirits whispered. Ionel remembered exactly that after one of the disasters, the divine beasts had lost contact with the spirits. 
But why could she see and hear them now? Ian left the girl in the garden. The spirits circled above her without ceasing. Ionel noticed that the spirits were afraid of Ian, but were drawn to her. Ionel remembered hearing similar voices during her rebirth, and when she was in danger. The girl guessed that the spirits had always helped her. Ian walked over to the girl and took her in his arms again. The spirits whispered that the bad man had returned. Ian told the girl that the bishop had arrived, and she had better not cross paths with him. Ionel couldn't understand why Ian didn't want her to meet the bishop. After all, he has a perfect reputation and is loved and respected by the people. He wants to scare Lucia. He's bad. But we will help. We will save Lucia. Have faith in us, the spirits whispered. The spirits turned into long pink threads and headed towards Perrin Manor. A quiet melody began to play. Something bad is definitely going to happen now, frightenedly, Ionel thought. Some of the divine beasts insisted on killing Perron. They believed that he was the harbinger of disaster. You can't talk down a defenseless child. No one knows if he will lead to disaster or not, shouted the divine beasts that were on Perrin's side. And why make such a spectacle of yourself in front of a child? Perplexed Lenore. Just because you were lucky enough to be born ordinary divine beasts doesn't give you the right to behave like this. What did I expect, though? Lenore exclaimed. Well, be that as it may, you can't kill a small child. He hasn't done anything yet. I won't let that happen. Perrin had already managed to save everything. However, a collar was placed around his neck that restrained his magic. The kid's magic is unstable. That must be why he has to use his adult form all the time, Hikan remarked. Piran was still very young. In his human form, he looked like a teenager, but with the help of divine powers, he could transform into an adult. Since his magic was unstable, he regularly returned to his usual guise to recover. Piran recently asked me if it was possible to bring a person back to life. I answered him that I don't have any information on that at the moment. Narrated Lenore. You don't know this, but he recently came to the Divine Forest and asked the elders for help right in front of everyone. Apparently after that, there was talk of his insanity. Are you sure he can be trusted with our Lucia? Asked Hikan. He's not crazy enough to harm a child, replied Lenore. Lenore opened the front door of Sir Abelard's manor and saw the bishop on the doorstep. Lenore disliked the bishop, but tried not to show it. It's been a long time, your lordship. I came here as soon as I heard you were here, said the bishop. It always seemed to Lenore that the bishop guessed that he was a sacred beast. The bishop suggested that the duke walk around the garden a bit. There has been a terrible fire in the Marquis of Azarel's house. I am very worried as it is you who is suspected. Since only the Marquis and Marquise's room was burning, it is rumored that it was not without magic, said the bishop. Also, during the banquet, their daughter behaved rudely towards your wife. Rumor has it that's why you hired the tower keeper. Huh, think about it. If I had the tower keeper himself listening to me like that, I would have achieved independence for the duchy long ago, said Lenore, laughing merrily. Damn, I think we've been figured out. That day, Vermont decided to wipe the Marquis and his family off the face of the earth. I promised Syria that there would be no problem. I did, however, ask Vermont to proceed with caution. Thought to himself, Lenore. Vermont suggested just setting a small fire in the house. He wanted to scare the Marquis into behaving more carefully. Not long ago, one of the bishops went to the creator. Strange things have been happening ever since. I hope you, your lordship, will refrain from senseless killing. The bishop went on to say, Speaking of which, I still haven't seen your daughter. Would you mind showing her to me? No, I am strongly against it because she is very small and afraid of strangers, replied Lenore. Suddenly there was an explosion. The sky was colored pink. This is clearly not a natural phenomenon, flashed through Lenore's mind. Ian had to create a large net to catch the scattered spirits. Moments later, the sky was a soft blue color again. So much for special kind of power, Ian summarized. Now I see what will happen if I don't learn to control my power, thought Ionel. With a loud shriek, Ian fell to the ground, releasing the girl from his arms. Ian grabbed his neck and began rolling from side to side. 
Ionel noticed that the boy's neck was covered in some hieroglyphics. A moment later, Ian fell to the ground unconscious. What on earth is going on right now? What are those signs on his neck? Ionel crawled over to Ian. Stay away from me. Ian wheezed. Black butterflies flew up to Ionel and began to chase her as far away from Ian as possible. I saw him rip his neck until it was bloody. I can't leave him. I have to ease his pain, Ionel thought to herself. When Ian opened his eyes, he saw the princess in front of him. Suddenly, Ian's body lit up with a bright light. Lenore and Hykon hurried to the light. When they approached, they saw Ian lying unconscious. Lucia was lying on the ground next to him. The duke took his daughter in his arms and held her tightly against him. I can't believe her power is out of control again. Then we'll have to do something about it, thought Lenore. Sitting in her father's arms, Ionel decided to think about the situation. She realized that she and Ian belonged to a special species so they could see spirits and use their power. Also, Ionel realized that spirits are quite willful, so it will take a lot of patience to fix them for herself. One would have to learn how to control them. The girl also guessed about the hieroglyphics on Ian's neck that hurt him when he used his magic. Ionel realized that she would face the same fate if she did not learn to control the spirits. The girl noted to herself that when Ian was unconscious, he called her Princess Ionel. She didn't remember ever seeing him in her past life. And why did he even bring up the princess? Ionel decided that as soon as she had the chance, she would be sure to ask Ian how he knew the princess. Still, all of these events are like thunder out of the blue. I find this whole situation extremely amusing. What about that case? The man in the black cloak asked the bishop. The perpetrator is still missing, replied the bishop. And how are Fernando and Lenore? inquired the cloaked man. We have followed your orders exactly, said the bishop. That is marvelous news, and keep your eyes on the young duchess, ordered the man in the black cloak. Big changes are coming, and we certainly don't need trouble. It's been almost two months since I turned into a divine beast named Lucia. All this time, my family has tirelessly taken care of me. They brought me to my room after I passed out and never left my side for a minute, thought Ionel. I noticed that they started looking at me with completely different eyes. What has happened? Do they really care about me a lot? In my past life, when I was sick, I was cared for by servants. Sometimes my father was so busy that he didn't even have time to visit me. Even though I was surrounded by care, I felt lonely. The next day, the brothers decided to have a small picnic for their sister. Since the girl was already able to walk, she was allowed to move around on her own. Hika! Veru! Yonel shouted joyfully. She really wanted to learn to speak as soon as possible to tell her new family everything, so she practiced tirelessly. Ionel asked her brothers for permission to walk through the garden. In the garden, Ionel happened to run into a blonde-haired boy. The mop of his hair resembled a stack of straw. Will you marry me? Unexpectedly, the boy asked. Hikan and Vermont kept their gaze fixed on the children sitting across from them. Sitting next to the children was their nanny. And how come we won't be vacationing here alone anyway? murmured Vermont. My name is Ilix, and this is my twin sister, Eva. The blonde-haired boy introduced himself. And I'm Lucia, Ionel introduced herself. What a beautiful name you have after all, the boy exclaimed. And that boy is smart yet he pretends not to notice how those two are looking at him, noted Ionel to herself. Join us, our nanny Gianna cooks the best, the kind of pies you sure haven't tasted, said Ilix. Ionel was glad that she met these children in the garden. In her past life, the girl had not been able to socialize with her peers. Her father had always been overprotective of her, so he had only allowed her to socialize with the maids. Ionel was overjoyed to have friends of her peers in this life. Suddenly, some boy ran up and poured a bucket of dirty water right on top of the pies. There was nothing edible in here anyway, the boy shouted in a joyful voice. His friends immediately ran up to him. Apologize now, Yanel shouted. She didn't have time to taste the cakes, so she was very angry. You're from the nobility, aren't you? Then be friends with us. Why do you need these commoners? Asked the boy. Came and ruined our whole picnic, 
thinks he can act like that because of the difference in status. Is the future of the Rochum Empire really that bleak? Horrified Ionel. Ionel suddenly realized that her older brother Hikan was unlikely to leave the situation and not react to it in any way. She ran up to her brother and began to beg for his arms. Ionel decided to distract Hikan to herself. The girl was sure that Vermont was more calm and sensible, so she was unlikely to do something stupid. Oh, I don't even know what to do for you. Vermont muttered thoughtfully. Ionel clutched tightly onto Vermont's cloak. No rumors could be spread that a fight had broken out in the park over the young duchess. Coward, hiding behind the adults, shouted the angry boy. You had a chance to get out of here in one piece, but you didn't take it. Hikan and Vermont exclaimed in one voice. Screaming loudly, the children, led by the angry boy, scurried away. They're from the nobility, aren't they? They come from the families of earls and marquis. Ilix muttered in a frightened voice. Don't worry, said Ionel. She guessed that Ilix was afraid of these children. They could come back and start retaliating. Ignorant commoners, what do you allow yourselves? Shouted a woman in a bright yellow dress who approached. Behind her stood several other ladies. Ionel knew that after a while this lady would have to take back what she said, for only the emperor's family was above the Elharan family. Lanner traveled to the city of Balin, which was located in the Seaside Empire. How peaceful it is here, not at all like Rochim. I envy it, Lenore thought as he watched the people of the city. I have noticed that all the people in this city are happy, and it's all thanks to you, my dear friend. Am I not right, Mohiant? Asked Lenore to the man hiding behind a tree. And why did you come here? Do you need something from me? Asked Mohiant. There's a ceremony for Lucia's birthday coming up, and it seems my daughter belongs to a special lineage. I wouldn't want anyone to know about it, replied Lenore. Have you gone completely insane? Mohiant exclaimed. No, you yourself remember Perrin's stories well. I don't want my daughter to be shackled too, or worse, killed. You know I will not stand by while my daughter is abused. That's why I've come to ask for your help, said Lenore. Okay, I agree. Mohiant knew that if he refused his mate now, he would feel guilty for the rest of his life. I'll open the vault and take the item that will allow me to contain her power, Mohiant promised. Thank you, but that won't be necessary. Syria is in the vault herself right now. She will take what she needs from there. From you, I want a different kind of help, Lenore admitted. Ionel and her new family returned to the Divine Forest. She had a birthday ceremony to attend. It was usually held at the Lake of Life. It was the most sacred place in the forest. Only there could one receive a true blessing. Ionel stirred at the bracelet on her paw. She really wanted to go back to the human world as soon as possible and take it off. Lucia, stop licking your paw. Be patient for a while. No one must guess that you are wearing a power-restraining bracelet, said Syria to her daughter. Divine beasts began to arrive for the ceremony. The elders of each species were also there. Ah, so this is little Luan Stella? Of course I was told that she was tiny, but she's even smaller than I thought. She looks like a newborn the elder of the wolf family exclaimed. Lucia, remember what I taught you. Lenore placed his daughter near the lake. Hours before the ceremony, Lanner told his daughter that in the reflection of the lake, the divine beast sees itself from the future. No one else can see it. And if the beast takes its form, the lake will show it the way to the six pillars of light. Ionel cautiously approached the lake and peered into it. As soon as Ionel touched the smooth water with his paw, it immediately turned pink in color. Ionel saw in the reflection of the water a large pink fox with many tails. A moment later, the water bubbled and rose upward. The lake grabbed Ionel and dragged her to the bottom. When Ionel surfaced, she saw several pillars of different colors. That's it! I've seen the pillars, so the ceremony is over. We need to go home. But how do I do that? If there's a door around here? Ionel thought to herself. What a strange fox. Surely she's a divine beast. And what is the name of such a little cutie? The pillars whispered. I belong to the silver fox species. My name is Luan Stella, shouted Ionel. Young divine beast, can you hear us? 
How is this possible? By the way, what's that bracelet on your paw? You look extremely suspicious, said the pillars. In the same second, the bracelet that Saria had carefully disguised with her magic flew off Ionel's paw. Did you really think you could fool us with such pathetic magic? What a stupid fox you are, after all. We have already guessed that you are a special species. You are the harbinger of disaster. Your very existence bodes doom for us, said the pillars. Ionel felt the lake begin to pull her to the bottom again. I am not a harbinger of disaster! I am not! screamed Ionel. You can't be left alive. We've already missed one. We cannot let the dark times come. Do not blame us, child. If you knew the calamity that awaits us, you would have accepted death yourself. The pillars exclaimed, and the lake pounced on Ionel with renewed vigor. Suddenly, Ionel took on human form and moved into the city on fire. Screams of frightened people were heard everywhere. They were crying out for help. This is the past. But you can't escape fate. Because of you, history may repeat itself. The pillars explained. No, I'm not. Please stop telling me these stupid things. Ionel clasped her hands tightly over her ears. Tears flowed from her eyes. Suddenly there was the sound of breaking glass. Hundreds of pink butterflies flew towards Ionel. We'll save you. In a quiet voice, the butterflies whispered and dragged Ionel behind them. A familiar, pleasant melody was heard. 